Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the Church, in her wisdom, appoints for us the three Sundays of the Triodian to prepare us for Great Lent. It is the only fast in which the Church warns us uh, that the fast is coming and, and encourages us to prepare. And last Sunday we heard the parable of the publican and the Pharisee. And we saw that it is only through humility that we can be justified before God, not by declaiming our own virtue, and certainly not by judging a brother, but rather through humility. Next Sunday, we'll have the Sunday of the Last Judgment. We will learn that this world will come to an end, that it will unravel, that it will dissolve, and that we have to give an account for what we have done with our life. But in this Sunday, the middle Sunday, is the Sunday, as we just heard, of the prodigal son, one of the most famous and well-known parables in all the scripture. I wasn't raised in the church, I wasn't raised even as a Christian, but even I, when I was a little boy, I knew the story. So famous is it, so well known, it's, it's become part of our language. And we hear that a man has two sons. That the younger son, the one actually with the least right to his father's inheritance, comes to his father and says, give me what is mine, give me what is coming to me. Give me my inheritance now, that I can live on it. This request is uh, deeply inappropriate. Right? It's, it's something that, you know, this, the son has no right to the father's property. He has no claim on it. It is something that he will only receive at his father's death. But he says, rather, give it to me now. We hear then, almost immediately, that he takes it, and very soon after, that he goes to a far country. It is difficult, because again, we are so familiar with this story, to look at it again with fresh eyes. But it's worth asking why he goes away. Why does he go to a far country? The father doesn't give him any stipulation. He doesn't say, well, I'll give you this property, but he just gives it to him. It's his. He can do with it what he will. And we hear he goes to a far country so that he can live in a riotous way. right? That he can, he can spend it uh, uh, with abundance. That he can engage and indulge his passions. That he can engage in riotous living, as the scripture says. But he could surely do that at home. There's no reason. There's probably a town there. He decides to go, presumably because he does not want to engage in riotous living under the eye of his father. He wants to take this wealth that he has received and use it in a riotous way without his father seeing, without his father knowing. Because he knows, the younger son, that he is doing wrong. He knows that he is living in an improper way. He doesn't want his father to see this. This is actually the, if we think carefully, the same experience that we all have in our own life. Because all of us, St. Nikolai Velmirovich says that we live in this creation as, as tenants of God, right? We live in his house, we're like guests, right? When we breathe, we breathe his air. When we eat, we eat his food. Or another way to reframe that is that we, particularly those of us in the church, those of us who are Christians and have been illumined, we live in this world as sons of God. We live in the house of the Father, and all the good things of creation are given to us as a free gift of God. We eat at his table. We breathe his air. But our desire, or my desire at least, is to take that creation and to use it for my own ends, to use it to indulge my passions, to use it in a sinful way, to use it not in a way that glorifies God and reveals his glory in creation. But in order to do that, I have to create a little separate world a little tight corner of my heart that I can keep separate from God and try to hide from him, just as the younger son goes to the far country to hide from his own father. Of course, this is impossible. This is foolishness. But it's something that we have to do, we do constantly. Again, when we do this, though, we misunderstand, just as the younger son misunderstands, that this creation is not ours. The things that belong to us in a legal sense are not really our property. They have been given to us by God to be used for good. Sometimes that means giving them to the poor. Sometimes that means giving them our family. Right? We're using them ourselves, but using them in such a way that we glorify God. So we hear that the younger son, he goes to the far country, he engages in his riotous living, he spends all that he has, and he ends up impoverished. He ends up, indeed, in dire straits, because we hear that there is a great famine in the land. 
that there is a great hunger. And so what does he do? It says that he attaches himself to a citizen of that land, not one of his countrymen, not one of his family, or part of someone who was part of his tribe. Instead, rather, he attaches himself to a stranger, and he begins to work for him. He begins to, ser to serve him, taking care of his farm animals, specifically his pigs. And it's significant that it's pigs, because pigs are an unclean animal, right, according to the Old Testament law. So he is working for a man who is not part of the house of Israel. He is not part of the children of God, the people of God. He's working for a strange man. And his situation is indeed worse than these very pigs. He looks at the food that the pigs are eating, and he is jealous. Because the pigs, at least, are living in a natural way. The pigs are pigs. They're eating their food. They're doing their thing. Whereas the younger son has decided to live in a fundamentally unnatural way, away from his father, away from his family. This, for us, I think, is the great central lesson of this parable. The most important lesson, at least, for me. Because our society and our age constantly tells us that we only truly find freedom in sin. That we find freedom in indulging our passions, indulging whatever thought comes into our head. And inasmuch as we are able to live by doing whatever we want, whatever thought occurs to us, by being able to fulfill every passion that arises in our mind, then we will be free. But this is not only wrong, it's the opposite. Because sin, inevitably, is slavery. And indulging every passion that comes to our mind, as we see that the younger son did in his riotous living, leads us to a place where we are in servitude and in slavery, where we are bonded to every thought that comes to our mind, where we are simply engaging in addiction. Any of you that have ever smoked cigarettes, you know, it's very fun, it's very enjoyable, right? Those first couple packs, and then after a while, you're just simply fulfilling a need. Right? There's no pleasure in it, there's no joy. You're just going out to smoke because you, you feel the need to do it, not because you get any pleasure or joy from it. And all sin operates this way. There is initially some small, shadowy pleasure that comes from it that might seem real, that might seem permanent, but slowly that pleasure goes away and all that is left behind is addiction. Rather, freedom, freedom is only found in Christ. Freedom is only found when we become partakers of divinity because it was for this reason that we were created. But that only happens when we are with our Father. Not when we run away from Him, not when we hide ourselves in a far country. And so we hear in the Gospel the wonderful phrase that he came to himself. He became aware of his situation. He became aware that he had become lower even than pigs because he was living in such an unnatural way that he had fallen below the level of a mean and unclean animal. And so he comes back to his father. And I think it's worthwhile for us to contrast these two interactions. Because at the beginning of the parable, what does the son say? Give me what I am owed. Give me what's mine. Give me what's coming to me. When he comes back to the father, he says, please, forgive me. Let, me. let me come, not as a son, but let me come as one of your hired servants. And of course, what does the father do? The father who has been waiting for him, who has been waiting for him to return. He clothes him in his own robe, just as God clothes us in his own divine nature. And he forgives him. It's interesting to note that the father doesn't chase after him, right? The father doesn't go to the far country to find him. Presumably the father knows that his son is not going to be living in a good way, right? If your young son came to you and asked you for a bunch of money and then went to France, you could assume probably he's not going to be living in a good way. The father knows this. He's aware of that. But he doesn't chase after him. He gives him the opportunity to come to himself, to repent and to return, because what God desires from us is not some kind of slavish relationship. He desires for us to come to ourselves, to realize that there is only freedom in God, and to return of our own free will, to engage again, once again, in the work of virtue, that we might be saved. Brothers and sisters, as I said, this Sunday, along with last Sunday, the next Sunday, are Sundays that are, 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 the Church gives us to prepare ourselves for the great fast. But now is the time now is the time when we should come to ourselves, just as the prodigal son. Because all of us, to one degree or another, are living in a far country. All of us have created parts of our life 
where we have tried to exclude God, where we have tried to say, this is for me, this part of my life, I'm going to hold back. We have tried to live in a riotous way. But the spiritual life doesn't work that way. God, the terrifying thing about God, the glorious thing about God, is that he demands all of us, our whole life, our whole being. But that in that, if we can surrender to that, we will find not slavery, not bondage, but rather the only possibility of freedom. So let us prepare ourselves. Let us examine ourselves that we can use the fast which is given to us by the church as a great gift to purify our noose, to clean our minds, that we can kneel with a clean heart at the foot of the cross, and that we can rejoice in purity for the empty tomb. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.